hosted by the UWI Faculty of Sport, looking at bubbles, bubbles in cricket, bubbles in football, bubbles in general, the new way of sport. We have a, a very wide and, and, and uh, diverse panel here, and we will be moderated today by Darren Ganga, well-known sports broadcaster, but also a very high-ranking executive in the Faculty of Sport. So over to you, Darren. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mansing, Dean of the Faculty of Sport. Uh, good afternoon. Greetings to all. Um, I feel very happy to be given the responsibility to moderate this webinar. As uh, Dean Mansing rightly said, title Exploring the Biosecure Sports Bubble. And uh, we have with us a list of prominent persons who will join us uh, for discussions. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Darren Sami, the captain of the St. Lucia Zooks uh, CPL team and our two-time ICC T20 uh, title winner. Welcome and thanks for giving us your time today. It's a pleasure for me to also introduce uh, Mr. Michael Hall. For those of you who would have looked at uh, the recent uh, Caribbean Premier League, uh, he is the director of operations for the CPL. Welcome to Mr. Hall. And last, by no least, Mr. Howard McIntosh joins us, an executive of CONCACAF, someone who's served the sport of football at all levels. And, you know, in a cricket-centric mix, we welcome you, sir, and we hope that you will bring that diversity that we expect across sporting disciplines. So for all of you watching from different parts of the Caribbean, different parts of the world, uh, we've seen a new phenomenon with the advent of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. That new phenomenon is biosecure sports bubble, which is something that has been created to facilitate competitive sport and elite sport, you would say. And before we get into the discussions with regard to maybe cost implications and how it has affected sporting disciplines across, across the globe, I think it's important for us to start talking about the building blocks of a biosecure sports bubble. And I'll go to Dean Mansing, who has just led uh, the Caribbean Premier League with its own biosecure sports bubble. We know that the first time this was introduced in a cricketing realm would have been in that recent series between the West Indies and England. And Dr. Mansing, I, I want to come to you first to ask your um, perspective on how do you set about building a biosecure sports bubble to facilitate a major sporting event like the CPL you, you sort of pioneered? Thank you very much. And, and I'll, I'll probably answer that by just explaining what the bubbles were and how they differed. In that, um, the first international sporting event to have resumed was actually cricket, and it was the West Indies Tour of England. And what had happened there was that we had a set of people going from the West Indies, which was a very low COVID infected area, to one of the highest COVID infected countries in the world. And so the important thing there was to keep us safe from the community. And we did what was called a contained, or what I call a contained bubble, meaning that we chose sites where the hotel was actually on the cricket premises itself. So the two sites that were, were chosen have the, had the hotel on the premises itself. It then meant making sure that we were negative by, by frequent testing. We're taken by chartered planes to Antigua. And when I say we, I mean the West Indian players. And then by a chartered plane to, to Manchester in England, onto coaches and straight into the hotel where we were tested again. And we were tested every week to make sure that there was no breach there. But while in the hotel, we were able to intermingle in groups of three and four while we were undergoing quarantine. Um, and we were able to train in that facility we were able to play our matches in that facility. All the entertainment was in that facility. And there was no mixing with anybody from outside, except for the caterers and so on, for which we had protocols. And that's what I call the contained bubble. When you're finished, you get onto a bus, you go to the second site, and over there, the same thing is repeated because the hotel is on the ground. At the CPL, it was a different scenario. Here, Trinidad and Tobago was chosen because they were COVID-free for 88 days. They had two facilities for playing. And the University of the West Indies grounds were chosen as a training facility, but these were not contained. And I, I described it as what I call a water in glove. If you take a glove and fill it with water, 
Everything is contained in the glove, but it's not all in one place. It goes down the fingers. Well, here we had 220 people that we had to incorporate into a bubble from 18 countries, every single continent, some of which were countries with the highest infection in the world, going into Trinidad, which had at that time no infection. So here we had us having to protect, or Trinidad having to be protected from us. It also involved carrying people, testing them before, making sure that they were negative, and those who tested positive had to be excluded because Trinidad's borders were closed, and we couldn't bring people in afterwards, obviously, because flights were not there. But everybody came in on chartered flights where we separated the non-CARICOM people who are a higher risk from CARICOM persons. We took them to the hotel where they went into their individual rooms and the deal was that for seven days they'd be in isolation in the room itself. But for the second seven days of the, of the quarantine, we're able to take them to the training facility at UWI along with allowing them space within the, the hotel to the gym, to the open areas and so on for exercise. And the idea was after two weeks, we would be safe for Trinidad and therefore we could be assimilated in the society. Well, things took a change because during those two weeks, Trinidad had their second wave. And because of that, we had to extend the bubble for the entire period, the entire seven weeks. And that meant that we now had to protect ourselves from the Trinidadian community by sealing off the, the, the hotel, making sure there's nobody coming in. We had no interaction going out. And I'll just end by saying that these are two different sort of things. The only places we could go in Trinidad was to the playing facility where once again at the facility, the grounds were separated from the players, the, the local media was separated from the, the overseas media and their TV production who are in the bubble. And the one person who perhaps could have made uh, a compromise, the, the head curator, had to be removed from the bubble so that he could interact with the local people. So it was a lot of adjustment, a lot of agility, and obviously, you know, change as things went along. And of course, Darren, you're in Abu Dhabi right now in the IPL bubble, which is yet another version of water and glove. But... I'll leave it at that to tell you that, you know, it was things on the move and the bubbles had to ensure that those in the bubble remain safe from those who potentially were infected. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Mansing, for that uh, thorough explanation of what took place uh, with the recent CPL. I'd, I'd like to bring in Mr. Hall now, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this biosecure bubble that I'm currently in for the Indian Premier League, which is unfolding at the moment. Mr. Hall, I, I just want to... Uh, to find out from you, we've just heard from Dr. Mansing, who was charged with the responsibility for the medical side of this biosecure bubble. You, obviously, as a director of operations, how do you integrate the considerations that Dr. Mansing uh, would have in this biosecure bubble and keep it to the point where it's manageable, it's reasonable, and it's acceptable? All right, thanks very much, um, Darren. I had to kind of look behind me for a second because it's not often that you refer to me as Mr. Hall, so I wasn't quite sure <clears throat> who you were speaking with. Um, Dean Mansing has been a little bit um, self-deprecating and trying to don't play the role that he and the other members of the medical committee had in successfully staging the CPL, but without their guidance and input from, the, from day one, we wouldn't have had a Caribbean Premier League in 2020. I'm just going to try and talk broadly, if I may, about operations and, and the challenges faced uh, within a biosecure bubble and staging a tournament. Um, there are some general truths about any event. Um, you know, you, you still have to start with a plan. You have to share the plan with your team. Um, you have to fine tune and agree. Uh, I think one of the things that struck me about this year's Caribbean Premier League within a biosecure bubble um, were what were the financial challenges. And I know that that's something that people really want to consider. What were some of the financial challenges this year? And certainly, we faced some tremendous and significant increases in terms of the cost of health and safety. Um, you know, the whole question of testing, the frequency of testing, the cost of each test, which I think to us came in at around 150 US dollars per test. Um, and I think that over the course of the tournament, that is to say, persons having to test in their home country before getting to the collection points. Because remember, you know, Darren, very few air countries were open, had open borders, yeah? And in terms of people coming in from international 
destinations or overseas destinations. We had two choices, really. We collected some people in St. Lucia and we collected some people in Barbados. And there were restrictions about people entering those two countries as well. So persons had to test in their home country. Um, some had to test when they arrived in either St. Lucia or Barbados. I think more so Barbados. But certainly once we got to Trinidad, which, and as Dr. Mansing mentioned, you know, the Trinidadians were looking at us with a very sort of suspicious look. You know, we were bringing the infection possibly into their country, which was, was clean and pristine. So we had to test many times. And I, I just want to say that testing alone um, probably cost the Caribbean Premier League anywhere between 150 and 200,000 US dollars for that consolidated five to six week period, right? Now, clearly that's an expenditure that would not normally exist. You, that's, that's just the test. But let's also factor in the, factor in the personnel who needed to be compensated. You know, Darren, you were at the Hilton with us. Um, you know, it's testing 230 people, you know, three, four times in a two-week period. Um, persons have to be there to administer the test, to gather the data, to transport, etc. So, tremendous additional cost. And one of the things that you must consider when you want to put on a sporting event in a biosecure bubble, how to how to compensate for these additional costs without compromising the quality of the product that you're going to deliver, hopefully, um, to, in our case, what was largely a viewing audience, because as you know, the, our games were played behind closed doors. Um, I can tell you that the compensation and how you compensate for these additional expenditures, which don't normally arise, um, is by everybody involved in this tournament making a personal sacrifice. What we had to spend extra on medical costs were removed in terms of certain administrative costs. And, more, and to put it bluntly, everybody associated with the event was asked to take a 30% cut in their normal remuneration. Yeah? It's a sacrifice that we all agreed to make in order to continue to project the CPL brand because we all felt that to have our brand absent for an entire year would have been just too damaging to the league commercially and just not good for your brand for it to disappear like that. Well, that's, that's pertinent information. And I'm sure for all sport administrators uh, across the region, across the globe, to know how costly it is uh, to have testing done, to make sure that you have a tournament that is successful. I guess some sort of feasibility study was done before for you to be able to sort of budget for that type of spend. And I, I want to bring in Mr. McIntosh here. You wear your football lens. We are seeing the premiership, uh, English premiership football tournament ongoing at the moment. How challenging it is when you listen to financial costs, like the ones that Michael just uh, mentioned, how challenging it is now to put on football, competitive football, maybe at a regional level, at a CONCACAF level, that must be a, a, a sort of challenge for administrators in the sport of football. Thank you very much for the question, Darren. And good afternoon to you and all the panelists and all the people looking and listening on. Uh, I've made it part of my responsibility that in all of the the sessions I participate in and lectures, I always give commendations to the people who have been working during this COVID time, especially those on the front line. So I want to send a special thank you to all of them, I'm sure on all of our behalf, to, um, to say to them thank you for the work that you continue to do. And then we get to the question of sport and the importance of it, because I know I know, generally speaking, you know, tourism, sports, and entertainment, we've taken the industries that have taken sort of the biggest hit in this. And I want to compliment all the persons that have participated in, in, the, in ensuring that the CPL happened. They did provide that, that entertainment that we all needed, needed at the time. I want to congratulate you on that. 
So I've been asked to bat at number three in this cricket environment. And I have no problem with that because I can take the pace. You know, Sammy and them bowling, so I don't have any problems with the pace. Um, we, the the biosecure bubble issue is uh, very serious. And I think Mike, Mike has touched on it even more drastically than, than Dr. Mansing. And I think part of the reason I have been invited to be on this panel is because Dr. Mansing and I have engaged in some serious discussions as it relates to the biosecure bubble. Now, I come from the perspective of initially, whether it was the CPL or the West Indies Tour, and even the IPL when they're in their planning stages, they would have had to think about a biosecure bubble and a contained bubble, as Dr. Manstein has pointed out. The same thing happened in football initially in Europe uh, with, with the EPL and with the, with the league in Germany and, and of course with the NBA in terms of this contained bubble. But then Michael raised the issue of the cost and the, those levels of cost that he's talking about in terms of the testing and of course uh, the accommodation cost is truly not sustainable in a, on a continuous basis. So the question that we are faced with in football was how are we going to successfully operate all of these leagues outside of a contained biosecure bubble, which is what is happening now in the EPL and in a number of the leagues around the world and is also happening in terms of closer to home here in terms of Mexico, in terms of Honduras. And so the, the, the question that I, you know, being the, the non-cricketer uh, in the grouping that, I, that I've been discussing with Dr. Mansing is how can we do it? And we have been doing it. The CONCACAF League, for example, just started last week in Panama, Nicaragua, and in Honduras. And the approach we have taken moving from the contained biosecure bubble is a controlled environment and, uh, and using Dr. Mansing's word, a contained environment um, with high frequency testing. And that is what is being used now in the EPL. And, uh, and part of the reason why Dr. Mansing and I have been having these discussions over the last couple of weeks has to do with assisting the league here in Jamaica in terms of getting restarted. Because having looked at the cost of the CPL, having heard about the cost of the West Indies cricket and the NBA, which is in millions of dollars, close to maybe billions, in terms of what they did with the NBA, it can't happen in our region because we just can't afford it. So we now have to go into what I suggest, which is a controlled environment. And the challenge there, of course, is that whereas when the CPL was starting, you had lower cases or lower incidences in terms of the COVID cases, you're now in a situation where, um, for the most part, everywhere has high incidences and questions how to do it. So the approach based on looking at all the guidelines, because as you, as you may be aware, Darren, there have been a number of return to play guidelines set out. So FIFA has done it, CONCACAF has done it, UEFA has done it, UA, the United States, I was just looking at the the league regulations for the CONCACAF League, they're the guidelines that are there, and it is now moving away, and this is where Doc is going to get excited, <laughs> moving away from the biosecure bubble to where you're now having this high frequency testing. We will not be able to afford the level of testing, for example, that's done in the EPL. So the, 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 we're now we're going to have to perform some type of magic is balancing, of course, lives, I mean, the health and safety is critical and the most important. The question now is how do you, in a place like Jamaica and in the Caribbean, get those leagues restarted um, at a professional level without uh, a biosecure bubble? And what can be done to ensure that we protect all the persons involved? 
So I come from a slightly different angle with a full appreciation for the need. Because, you know, I, I have my own family bubble. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I have, and I have my I own social bubble, you know, but th there's a reality now in terms of getting, getting the leagues restarted, which we have done in Concacaf. That's great to hear, Mr. McIntosh. And I guess it's a, it's a matter of managing risks as well. The England Cricket Board has spent close to a million pounds in testing this summer. And once they have the finances to do so, you would think that sporting organizations will... Um, see it as a priority because there are pre-existing contracts which uh, need to be fulfilled. And I know the whole revenue model behind sport for majority of sport are already sort of set uh, here in the IPL. You know, the IPL would have signed over rights for cricket and, and there's a certain obligation towards the rights holder. So I understand the, the, the sort of pressures for governing bodies uh, with regard to having high-level competitive sport back um, and even during this pandemic as well. I, I want to just bring in Darren Sami here because we've been talking about the setting up of, of uh, this biosecure bubble, some creative ways of creating that containment that you spoke about, Mr. McIntosh, to have sport at the lower levels, maybe regional and even amateur levels. I want to come to all of you all a little bit in terms of the impact on grassroots sport because as we know, Elite sport can't function without a continuous development at the elite levels all the way up. So, so I'll come back to, to you guys on that. So, Darren, I, I want to ask you from an athlete's perspective, you had the chance of competing in the recent Caribbean Premier League. The administrators tried everything possible to ensure the safety of the players. How was that experience for you? Thank you, Darren, and good afternoon to all our our guests and to those viewing. Um, yeah, firstly, I must um, commend Michael. I think uh, after the finals, I did highlight, you know, the work that he did in operating um, the, the, the CPL and, you know, Doc Mansing and his medical team, you know, what transpired um, in the Hilton and the two venues was something special, um, you know, for, for us, athletes, you know, this came, um, if I could speak about, you know, um, I, I touched on, you know, the mental, the mental toughness of, of, of some of the players, because for, for the first time, you probably would have guys, you know, for the first seven days, you know, just isolated, you know, normally, they could um, they would be traveling with families. Um, they would have that, or they could go mingle with their, their, their teammates and, and and stuff like that. That was not possible. So that was uh, for me and my team. That was one of the challenges that we feared that you know a youngster who's now playing in their first CPL having to to be isolated in his room, you know, not being able to go outside. So that that posted a, a challenge. Also, I think, you know, with the, with the, the need to have the CPL, like, like you know, I think the preparation for the players who were in England coming without any match practice, you know, because the, 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 the islands or where they were coming from were were on the shutdown and to come into the tournament seven days and then uh, the next seven days where you start preparing that posted uh, some sort of a, of a challenge but we as as cricketers we we understood you know that in order for us to to have the tournament and and, and continue earning a living doing what we love um, under these con con conditions um, they had to be sacrificed and we that's some of the sacrifices you had to do but i in the end you know i must commend the the, the medical team and, and the operations team on the way they held things together because once the, the first seven days um were completed and guys started coming out of the rooms and being having access to the gyms and having access to the facilities and 
be able to practice. It became not about, you know, maybe you can't um, get what you want to eat when you want to eat it. You know, these things, you know, you will get that even when there's not a, when there's not a bubble. You know, you might tour, you might tour Dubai, you might tour England, and you might not get a, a Jamaican restaurant, and you might complain about that. So that was the minor stuff. And um, I must say, once, you, once the tournament went on, you know, they made sure they had a games room, you know, um, building a team. And I'm very big as that, as a leader, having that, that, that cohesiveness, that, that camaraderie. I think one of the positives for Zooks this year was the ability for us to meet together. Once those seven days were over, my team was in the, in, in, in the, the Zooks team room. We played dominoes, we were talking about cricket, we played pools, that, that room that CPL put together to just have the guys socialize with, the, with, with no access to the outside world. You know, those little things really did create an avenue for guys to get to know, to know each other and start the team bonding process. But all in all, yeah, I would say mentally um, and some of the preparation, um, the time frame in which you had to prepare for a tournament, that was some of the, the, the challenges posted. Thanks for that, Darren. And, and I've heard and spoken to, to persons uh, in a biosecure bubble, athletes, uh, administrators, officials. They mentioned that strict quarantine period uh, for most of the bubbles. Most countries, they ask persons to quarantine for full 14 days. I think the organizers of the Caribbean Premier League, even here the Indian Premier League, they've been able to negotiate with the respective governments to reduce that to seven strict days and after a further seven days of it being open within that secure bubble. And, and you mentioned from an athlete's perspective, the change that, that you have to experience, which is limited social interactions. A routine is something that most athletes sort of premise their play on. And, and when you're in an environment where you're restricted, I, I just draw a reference to the recent NBA and the fact that all teams had to go uh, to Walt Disney World Resort. And it was mentioned from many of the players that the fact that they had the chance to go boating, uh, to go fishing, uh, to go to Disney Animals Kingdom, those sort of opportunities really helped them and assisted them in terms of the mental side of this challenge. And, and Dr. Mansing, I, I want to ask both yourself and, and Mr. Hall, when this biosecure bubble is being set up, to what extent do you consider the mental wellness and well-being of the persons who are going to be within this uh, secure bubble? Well, I'll just kick off by saying that it's obviously taken into consideration. Going forward, every organization is paying more attention to this now. Um, in the Western East Tour of England, we actually traveled with a psychologist during the CPL for the first few days when things were getting a bit tight because persons were, were, were really feeling the stress, we had tried to engage a psychologist to speak to them because, of course, we we're in isolation and, and get them through that. As Darren, has, Darren Sami has mentioned, that when you free that up and you allow other activities, it makes it better. But nonetheless, just confinement. And Darren, you can speak of your own experience in the IPL bubble and contrast it to the CPL bubble. But the bottom line is that you've got to keep people active. And remember that you have sportsmen whose job is to run in the sun all day, and you're telling them to stay in a room. Number two, we were the first two bubbles in the sporting scene to speak of. And the issue we had in the Caribbean is what some people can't appreciate. We had players from countries like St. Lucia, St. Kitts, Anguilla, who didn't know what COVID was. Their countries had no COVID. One chap told me that he was at three street fets the, the week before because they didn't have any restrictions in their country. Put them in an isolated room and you have to pay attention to mental health. So I just wanted to, before I, before I hear from Mr. McIntosh or Mr. Hall, I, I just want to mention some nuances that I've experienced uh, from being in, in the CPL bubble to now being in the IPL bubble. At the CPL, persons staying within the Trinidad Hilton had the chance of having an open air balcony. In this IPL, that was not available, and that that is immaterial. But having lived in a room for seven days, 
routine, not having a balcony, made me appreciate how important having a balcony at the Trinidad Hilton was during my time of quarantine at the CPL. And it is quite challenging. If you think about yourself being confined in a room where you can't get fresh outside air, being from the West Indies, it, it gets to you. So apart from, from that being one significant difference, here in the IPL, what they've done as against what the CPL has provided, they've created separate biosecure bubbles for teams. They've created separate biosecure bubbles for the television production team. So you have eight or nine biosecure bubbles separate and apart from each other. And what they do as well here is they try to zone these bubbles at a particular game. Obviously, the officials, the umpires, they have to be out in the open. Teams will have to interact to a certain extent with each other. But primarily, what they've done is they've created zones within a, a particular facility here. There are three facilities being used, one in Dubai, one in Sharjah, one in Abu Dhabi. And as commentators, we don't get a chance to get interactive with the players, with the officials. We've got to confine ourselves in that commentary box space unless you're doing a toss or you're doing a pitch report. And I, and I want to give you a little deeper insight into things from a broadcast perspective. Usually when you're broadcasting sport, you broadcast sport with the experts alongside a producer, a statistician, and certain persons who contribute towards the quality of the production. In this IPL, commentators are entirely on their own and everyone else is remote to the commentators. So you're doing commentary and you have a producer who is in a separate room. You're doing commentary and you don't have a statistician that is in the same room that you're in. So everything is being done remotely. Interviews with players primarily are being done with a remote speaker and a camera. So you're talking to a player from a remote commentary box. And it is quite weird because it is not the established norm in the industry. So those are little nuances that I'm experiencing here in Abu Dhabi. But I think the main goal behind those individual bubbles is to reduce risk. And we're talking about the risk of infection. So that if one person gets infected in a bubble, it doesn't expand into other bubbles. Another piece of technology that I've seen in this biosecure bubble is a tracking device. And that is something that we didn't use in, we, we didn't use in the CPL, but every single person who is involved in the IPL has a digital tracker, which allows the organizers to track you in terms of your movements physically. So they can tell who you've interacted with, who you've not interacted with. And that's another way of containing any particular risk that may rear its head. So, so those are things I, I, I just wanted to share, but I want to get back to the conversation. Well, Darren, Darren, if I could just quickly intervene, because some of the players have actually made comment of the fact that because you're in a bubble with your own team, there's no interaction with other players either. And therefore, that's restricting. Whereas in the CPL, one thing they appreciated that you could meet with other players from other teams. Lastly, we did have a tracking device in the CPL. It was called Michael Hall. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. And I think, I think the challenge of that social know, interaction... Now we know, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so I want to get back to the point of how do we provide for let's say sport at the semi-professional level, at the grassroots level, or even, as, as you just now mentioned, Mr. McIntosh, at CONCACAF level, where it's not a World Cup, where your budget is quite low, what are the creative ways, now having had the experience of being in a biosecure bubble and seeing bubbles, what are the creative ways we can put forward to ensure that sport starts to open up? at these other lower levels? I think the lessons from the biosecure bubble will be instructive for, or has been instructive for all of us. Um, <laughs> from a cost standpoint, in terms of what is affordable and, and what is sustainable. 
but also the, 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 the lessons that have been learned over the last, let's say, six, seven months in terms of um, an approach to ensure that sports happens. Now, the, the, the key thing for many of us will be how, you know, Dr. Mansing, Michael, Marion from a player perspective, help us in this transition to where, and, and, and for now, the focus is really on professional sports. I don't think a lot of consideration is being given to amateur sports, and I'm talking about school sports and stuff, at this stage, because <clears throat> then you're going to have to bring into it community consideration. Because in professional sports, like, like what was done with uh, CPL, IPL, and the West of the stores, um, you can, the first thing you can say is no fans. And then you have to operate in a particular stadium that you can control that environment. So when you remove the fans, even though in some parts of Europe now, they have slowly started to reintroduce the fans with the protocols, you know, social distancing and all the other protocols. So that's being slowly done at this time. So the, the reason, and the reason why I focus on professional sports, which is part of the conversation therein that has to be changed because, you know, we're coming from a history where sport was not seen as necessarily a professional avenue for you to have a career. And there are many that are still stuck in that particular mindset. So even when you're talking about the professional league in, in a Jamaica and in Dominican Republic and in Panama and some of these places, you're talking about people that are actually earning a living. So we, we try to switch the conversation, not just from one of sports, sport and sport as entertainment, but the fact that the people participating actually have to make a living in the sport that they're playing. So I use the example of the professional league in Jamaica. The truth of the matter is there's only one sport that has a professional league in Jamaica outside of um, horse racing. Because horse racing is a sort of different, I can't say animal. Anim yeah, man, animal. <laughs> a, different, a different set of circumstances. But the professional league here in, in Jamaica, uh, you really have, uh, let's say, 600 persons that rely on the league for a living. So it's not just about getting sport back up and going, but it's actually providing an opportunity for the persons to get back to work. So the same, the similar considerations that you take into people in a BPO or going into going into work, you need to take that consideration. You've had now the lessons of the biosecure bubble. We have to draw on that and transition now into what we are terming a controlled environment, and I, and I keep repeating that because, you know, the biosecure bubble gets you into a context which we know we can't sustain, cannot be sustained um, because of the cost implications and other types of circumstances. So we want to know, given these lessons, lessons given these experiences, use those to develop the the controlled environment and how best we can introduce with high frequency testing and how best we can use that to get the various situations. And as I said, they have been happening um, as it relates to amateur sports. That is something to come. Well, I just, I just want to, I just want to add here a comment from Jamil Dan Clare. As research and technology improves with regards to testing the cost of testing will be greatly reduced. The exultant testing cost phase initially might not be a great factor in the near future. Again, remember you can send your questions in on YouTube for the panel to discuss, to respond. And, and Michael, based on, on what we're hearing here in terms of the considerations, yes, a lot of what you did with the CPL allowed you to do so because you had the financial strength to do so. Given that experience that you've had, what will be your recommendations for other promoters, other administrators in other disciplines who might not be in that favored position to fund 
that biosecure bubble? Is it just a case of ramping up testing, taking measures and precautions? Yeah, thanks, Darren. Look, I think, I think Howard has stressed it um, quite clearly in, in the opportunity that he has had to speak. The, the circumstances around the Caribbean Premier League and any tournament of a relatively short time span I think are vastly different from the considerations that have to be applied to something like, um, you know, a traditional season of professional football involving league play over a period of sometimes six, seven months, sometimes more. Um, that, I think, is where the challenges are going to really lie. The CPL and persons organizing a tournament of five, six weeks duration. It seems odd to say this when I spoke about so many costs associated with, with, with health and, and safety, but have an, it has an advantage. There's a fixed amount of time. I mean, I know a football season is a fixed amount of time, but it's vastly expanded. So there's a fixed amount of time um, in terms of the considerations having to do with accommodation and ground transportation. Um, you can sort of plan your way around that. I think something that's very important, um, and I'm sure Howard and the, the, the folks involved in trying to jumpstart football in Jamaica have considered, um, all of the participants are in a single location. They're transported in vehicles which remain domiciled at that location and which are fumigated and sterilized each and every day. Are you going to do that with a football season for seven months? I don't think you can. Um, when, when people leave the biosecure environment and go to train or to compete uh, in the matches, that's where they go, that's where they, uh, th th that's where they leave from, and that's where they return to. What, what, what happens with, you know, and I'm going to make a specific reference here, what happens with respect to, you know, the, the, the Premier League here in Jamaica? Teams are community-based. Um, when their players go to a game, they, they may go to a biosecure environment to play the game. When they leave, where do they go? Do they all go to the same place? Are they returning to their communities where, you know, where, where there may be community spread or may not be? And uh, are, there, are they supposed to then follow certain protocols, i.e. don't leave your home and don't, you know, I don't know. Um, and I suppose that's where the, the, the additional testing comes in because you can't control their movements and you can't control where they stay and move and go to. Um, you know, that's why you have to test more frequently. That, that, that I think, is where the challenge is, Darren. Um, yeah. You know, for people putting on a league or people putting on a tournament, you have to look at it through different lenses, right? And sure. I just want to say, oh, finally, that when you're talking about um, a condensed time period. So maybe you're talking about when you get to the playoffs for the league and you can consider or contemplate housing everyone in a single environment. It's very important then to make sure that your service providers and who you engage to be service providers are key and that you think about the things that Darren Sammy spoke about in terms of do you have a facility that can lend itself to um, isolating the people you know, can you afford to buy out the property so that only your people are in there and keep them secure, which is what we had to do. So there, there, there are a number of things that you have to consider and you have to look at it, as I say, through different lenses, depending on your circumstance. Yeah, I, I guess the other, the other considerations will be when you're thinking about putting on an event, it has to be with the national guidelines. Not everyone has the bandwidth to fly players to a destination or a location that is COVID-free. Uh, so there are still cost implications if you go in that manner, and, 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 and still it poses a challenge. Now, I want to I get to Dean Mansing a bit in terms of the viability of this biosecure bubble and adaptations going forward. We heard from Darren Sami about the mental challenge that athletes face and he himself faced during the recent CPL. Is it a case where as we go further uh, into planning and organizing sport, that considerations will, will, will have to be weighted heavily towards the social side of, of these biosecure bubbles in terms of having games, rooms, maybe a facility that offers more open spaces. How, how do you see that 
given the fact that you've now seen a number of biosecure bubbles across different sporting disciplines. How do you see that unfolding and, and what sort of time frame organizers should look towards in terms of investing in this biosecure bubble, given you know, the, the research and the development that is happening on the COVID side with a vaccine? Um, thanks for that. And, and what I'm going to ask after this is if Darren Sami can put the player's perspective into it because that clearly informs what, what's required. But just to, one thing just to start off with, Jamil, um, was it Dan Clare, had stated that with technology improving, the, the cost of testing will reduce. And there is, in fact, an open source saliva test that was trialed in the NBA, which only cost $10 for the reagent and is, is 93% specific sensitive whereas the, the more traditional tests are 98%, 99%. So after your first PCR test, you can look at going towards this, this saliva-based test. Number two, there's this concept of pool testing, where you know if I had a team of 20 people, I'd have to do 20 tests. But what you can do is swab everybody and put that test in one medium and test it. If it comes negative, it means all 20 people are negative, and therefore you've saved yourself 19 tests. If it comes back positive, you're going to have to go back and swap everybody, but it's only 21 tests you're doing. So that way you can cut the costs over teams. So that's one side to do with the testing. But Darren, just put it simply, it's a balancing act. And the balance is this. You have high-risk sports, or you have sports that are stratified. So golf, horse racing, tennis are all what you call low-risk sports. Cricket is a, a medium-risk sport. And football and netball are high-risk sports just by the nature of contact you have. And then you have high risk and low, low risk countries. So if you take the Jamaican scenario, for example, I'm very optimistic because we've moved from having 200 cases a day three weeks ago to 100 odd cases a day two weeks ago to now double digits. We had 35, 40, 53, that kind of stuff. And I can anticipate that in the next few weeks, we'll have far less cases, hopefully. And therefore, the higher risk sports like football can be considered because you can, you can balance it off low risk. If you take that on a CARICOM perspective, we have countries which are still COVID free. And so if you're looking to put together an event, maybe you want to be looking to those countries. And I mentioned some of them as I did, even though St. Lucia went into lockdown this weekend, it's still low risk, um, you know, St. Kitts uh, and, 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 and many other, Grenada, Anguilla, et cetera. So it's a balancing act and you've got to take the national policies, as you say, in the national figures with the risk of the sport, with the risk of having spectators. And I think as we go along, you'll see that balance taking place. But in the end, it's what, appeals to the spectators and what's comfortable for the players. I have a question that I want to put forward to the panel and it's coming from Aldim Fasi. Is there a documented standard for developing a biosecure environment? And this is quite interesting because this panel has prominent administrators, a prominent uh, regional athlete, a world-class athlete. Should we be looking at putting together a standard document that will guide administrators, athletes, and all sport practitioners in terms of playing competitive sport and professional sport in today's COVID-19 pandemic. All right, I'm, I, I'm, I'm gonna jump in quickly. Of course, we had to document, um, uh, you know, we had to create a protocol document, which we had to share with every single person in our cohort, and our cohort included, obviously, the athletes and the support staff. So all the teams, you know, the, the, the match officials and uh, the broadcast crew, everybody received this document. And, you know, it spelled out what to expect because clearly um, anybody coming into a situation or a scenario that is unfamiliar, the more information you can give them before they arrive, you know, the better it is, assuming they read it. Um, and yes, there should be some sort of documentation, but I think that we, we can't get too cookie cutter because there's always the consideration of what obtains in the national jurisdiction that you're going to stage, whatever the event is. And so while you can try and produce some sort of generic guideline as to the things that you ought to be looking out for or ought to have in place, I don't think that there's any sort of one size fits all document that can be produced just my off the top of the head comment on that darren i want to get you involved sammy that is um there's a west indies team that is going to new zealand what will be your advice for a young player going to new zealand with you having that experience in the cpl 
So that you've heard um, guys like David Warner and Jason Holder and all these guys who have been Jason. This is his first bubble, and he said it cannot continue like this because um, you have to take account an, an elite uh, athlete. You know, sometimes they're out uh, nine, eight to nine months of the year on the road, touring, playing. You know, so to have a to be in a buy in a bubble throughout that period of time, that's that's gonna be very very tough on the mind um, and on the, the the players itself. Um, mentally, you have to be you have to be tough, guy. I think one of the things that um, the CPL probably should have considered in hindsight was having probably a psychologist uh, or mental coach or some some sort of of of, of of avenue where guys could, you know, have a conversation or they could have those little one-to-run -one interactions with more so the younger players or, or who knows, because people do go through that, that sort of, 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 of a thing. Um, to a youngster going to New Zealand, you know, um, the hardest thing would be, would be the mind. The first, the first 14 days, as Ben Stokes um, said in New Zealand was, he wouldn't wish it on his enemy. So it must have been really, really tough. So if um, the West Indies Cricket Board and Cricket New Zealand could come to an agreement, because everybody going into New Zealand will be going with testing being done. I also, I always ask the question, if it's a bio bubble, and so far everybody has tested negative to the virus, why isn't it's, you know, movement among teams, like the zones you speak about, that's in, 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 I, in IPL. Why can't these guys move freely amongst themselves since they're coming in with a, a negative um, test result? So that will ease the, the, the mental strain of having to be isolated for that extended period of time. But I must say, once the cricket starts, you know, the athlete now tends to get a little bit of normalcy into, into the game. Um, um, but touching on one of the things that, um, that Mansing and, and, and the questions that you asked, I think um, for us here in St. Lucia, like when, before I left to go to Trinidad, I was free, St. Lucia was COVID free. So in order to implement the, the sports at the junior levels, it all based, I think, on what the country is going through at that moment, how secure that, 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 that island is in terms of, of, of the COVID where you could now implement sports in the schools and um, in, in the clubs and stuff like that because we do need some form of, of, of development going throughout that period because um, if, um, let's say, these things continue for, for, for the next six, seven um, to, or to a year, we need to find a way to start putting back mm -hmm. our youngsters into competitive um, type of cricket. But mentally prepare your mind. And West Indies team, I think they need a mental coach going down there with, um, with, with, with the team to help calm the situation. Yeah, some players, as you, as you know, Darren, some players turn to um, gaming as a, a way of distracting them. <laughs> People try to play a musical instrument. I have a question for Mr. McIntosh. We have this question coming from Quan B. Uh, and it has to do with the feasibility of the Jamaican League to be played without all players staying in a secure, isolated area. Is that possible at all? Uh, let me answer it this way. I think we've touched on some of the points already. First, the first thing is the law of the land and the authorities there in terms of the Ministry of Health and Wellness in this case, in terms of determining and what would be the particular protocols and guidelines under which it can be played. And then, then we have to work with, with, with persons like Dr. Mount Singh and the, the, the medical committee in Jamaica and various other experts in trying to develop the appropriate protocols for training, which is one aspect of it, and then for the competition. Um, like Dr. Mansing said, we are, and we are, I mean, at Concacaf, we are assisting as much as we can, and we're very optimistic that there will be the possibility that the league will be 
played, um, considering what, is, what has been happening with the COVID case count and also with the types of controls that have been proposed for the teams and the competition. As I said, we, this is not an effort that is being done by the Federation here in Jamaica alone. It's going to take a lot of collaboration to make it happen and looking at what is happening in the various territories and you know, using the FIFA, CONCACAF, UEFA and other countries' guidelines in terms of putting this in place. But at this juncture, you know, you wait to hear from the authorities, the Ministry of Health, but it does look um, possible. And I think there's a way to do it. It's being done, as I mentioned, in other territories. Uh, the EPL now is not necessarily in, a, in the type of biosphere bubble that, that um, Dr. Manstein and Darren and Michael you know, were in and you know, put together. It's being played now with frequent testing. Obviously, in places like Jamaica, you won't be able to test at the level that they be able to test. But there is a regime that hopefully, with the proper guidance, can be put in place to ensure that the league does operate. With the other consideration, of course, being that we have to get the, the economies of the various territories that are affected up and going and get people working again. I guess that's the challenge for all governments in the region. How do you balance the safety of people as against uh, keeping that economic wheel turning? Now, gentlemen, we have just under 10 minutes uh, remaining. I know, Michael, I'll come to you for closing comments, but I also want to ask you to respond to the fact, I'm sure you're in the planning stages of Caribbean Premier League 2021. How do you plan in a situation where there is a moving target? COVID-19 you can't really predict what is going to happen in 2021. That should be a challenge for you. Um, yeah, absolutely, Darren. I mean, you, how do you plan uh, for 2021 in a situation where you're unsure of whether or not, you know, all of the territories where franchises are domiciled will have open borders and be able to host? What you do, Darren, is, is that you run several scenarios. You know, you do one, a best case scenario, which is that we will be back to some level of normalcy and that every country will be able to host games as we have been accustomed to. Um, you do one where you have maybe a maximum of three countries being able to host, given what the current situation is, and you do your best case um, or your best possible projections. And then you do another scenario where you're going to be confined to a single country. Um, you have to run scenarios simultaneously and, and do the best that you can um, and, and hope that the models that you have set up, uh, you are able to actually fit the tournament into one of those as you draw nearer. Um, quite naturally, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will be able to return to things as they, they were before. Um, you know, the, the, the fans are the lifeblood of, of our league and any other sports league, quite frankly. Um, if not the economic lifeblood, because quite frankly, that comes from your television revenues, but certainly the feel-good lifeblood of the CPL and all of the sports leagues is the fan interaction. Um, and I know that as much as Darren and the other cricketers who took part in the CPL this year got into their stride and got into their groove after maybe you know the first two or three days of competition, the fans not being around, I think, um, you know, the players certainly miss that. So... Uh, that, that's all you have to do. It you, you have to try to create all the different possibilities and, and work to develop those. Thanks, thanks a lot, Michael. Mm -hmm. I, I want to come to to you. You see it going in that trend that Mr. McIntosh spoke about: uh, sporting organisation administrators organising competitive sport with less intensity, um, using more innovative means. Is that the direction? That, that you're seeing with this COVID-19 pandemic and for sport in particular? Yes, um, there has to, it can't be status quo and it can't sort of be as rigid as it was before. So there has to be that same balancing act I was talking about. But yes, indeed, I think what you're going to see as things play out is that there's going to be a, a lot more uh, knowledge about how to hold, you know, what the virus does, how to hold it. For example, just three things, wearing a mask, 
washing your hands or sanitizing and social distancing seems to be the, the main ingredient. So if you can get the spectators to do that, you can get the teams to do that, you can get communities to do that, you're going to succeed more often. Now, in Jamaica, I think by and large, most people get the message. Around the Caribbean, most people get the message. And therefore, to rely on them to do so, I think we can, we can see some workable solutions coming out. And then if not, then step one, two, three that Michael just described of having the worst case scenario, medium case or, or, or best case would come into play. So yes, I do see changes and, and, and easing of restrictions as we go forward. Captain Sami, is, is the way forward getting yourself mentally prepared without having a lot of uh, net practice, without having a lot of game time? Is that something that you will advise persons to do? Prepare yourself to play competitive sport without the normal scenario that you would have had as an athlete and, and getting accustomed as well on the other side of defense of playing without crowd because that must have been a significant difference for you in this year's CPL. Yeah, Darren, um, you, you, you often hear people say, you know, that the sport is 90% is mental, how, how challenging, how, how you could put your mind under pressure and still respond in a positive way. So um, I think just naturally being in the bubble now, players um, and athletes' mental toughness is being tested. And you could see who are a cut above the rest in, 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 in that regard. Um, also, um, in order for, for sports to continue, you know, I think um, different measures, like I mentioned, you know, the, 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 having the, the people in specified in, 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 that, in those areas of mental challenge, mental um, toughness, um, more, more attention must be given also to the, to towards the preparation of that team, whether it is, you don't want too many times, uh, times being spent in the bubble, but you need to give uh, sportsmen adequate time to prepare, because you still want the, the competition and, and the product out there uh, being displayed at a high level um, that, that the fans are used to. And, and lastly, um, you know, just you in, in, in that bubble, you know, the, the measures put in place, you know, um, like whether it be the game, and I see, I saw Mumbai Indians dressing room uh, or team room. It just looked somewhere you want to be, you know. But um, that is something that you, you would have to get to know your your team and, and the players that you have individually. Because gaming might work for one, but it might not work for another. But um, all in all, I think to have sports back on TV. You know, the measures that's been taken by administrators, by medical team, by government, you know, you cannot stress on, uh, uh, enough or, or, or commend them enough for, for giving athletes and the world and the fans an avenue to, to showcase their skills and earn a living and, and you know, bring smiles, you know, because whilst they are they're isolated, I'm at home every day, every day watching the IPL, seeing you, commentating, knowing that this guy is moving from bubble to bubble. So it's been, it has its positive as well, but there's always room where we could, we could better, better each other, whether it be for administration and, and, and players. Excellent stuff, Darren. And, and I guess uh, many of the athletes looking on could take uh, information from what you've just shared. Finally, Mr. McIntosh, I know that you represent not just your comments you would like to make before I close this session. Well, well just, to, just to thank you, Darren, for, for conducting it very well. Thanks to our panelists. I see Mr. McIntosh is back, so we can probably get a last word from him. But I'll just, I'll just sign off at this point by thanking everybody who's tuned in uh, currently and who will tune in, in the future to thank the panelists, to thank Mona Information Technology Service for, for putting this together. And of course, this is going to be a monthly event. And so I urge everybody to look forward to joining in on our, our bulletins, we'll put them out. So thanks again to everybody and to you, Tudara. Thanks very much, Dean Mansing. Let me express my personal gratitude to everyone who took the time, uh, members of the panel. Um, I know that your schedules are quite busy, but I'm sure this will be information that the entire region and the world will take on board because it's a novel scenario that we're facing in sport. And we do hope that... Uh, Competitive sport will continue to, to be our respite for the challenges of this COVID-19 pandemic. So on behalf of the University of the West Indies Faculty of Sport, uh, we're closing this webinar session and we do hope that you join us for the next one in November. Thank you all. Manners and respect. Thank you.
One love.